Good afternoon. My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the founding CEO of the Perth US Asia Center at the University of Western Australia. And it's my great honor to welcome you all to join us in this first of what will be daily sessions during the course of this week, focusing on ASEAN and Southeast Asia more broadly. These are part of the third annual Western Australia uh, ASEAN Trade and Investment Dialogues that the Perth US Asia Center has been doing together with the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation and the West Australian State Government. Uh, this really has been something that has been a, a tremendous uh, honor for the center to run for the last several years. Uh, the two previous years were, as you might imagine, in person here in Western Australia and conducted under the broad objective of helping our community here in Western Australia understand the tremendous opportunities and developments that are taking place in our near neighbors in Indonesia and Singapore and Vietnam and Malaysia and Thailand and the Philippines and all the countries that make up the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And at the same time, we're hoping to inspire uh, the business community here to understand how dynamic the community there is in, in these regions. And so what we've been able to do for the last two years and what we will do during the course of this week is bring to you stories and narratives and specific examples of individuals who have made it good in the region uh, and the implications that will have for how Western Australians engage and Australians more broadly engage with Southeast Asia. This year, uh, like so many things, uh, due to the, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic globally, we have made the decision to do what would have been a one day conference virtually and given the, the, the length of our, our attention spans, but also the time we've got, we're going to do five sessions during the course of an entire week uh, that will be accompanied by other events uh, and that will be giving us a chance to have a better understanding of the opportunities that we've got, uh, both here in Western Australia and with our partners in Southeast Asia. I'm gonna be joined later on during the course of this first hour by Minister Peter Tinley, who's the Minister for Asian Engagement here in the West Australian State Government. Uh, but what we're gonna do is, is, as we're waiting for him to arrive in the studio, go ahead with the program that we've got planned today. Uh, and that is a very fortunate pro program. We we've, have a guest speaker who is joining us via Zoom from Indonesia, uh, and that is Ms. Alicia Solisto, who's the Deputy Managing Director of the Bauer Group Asia. Uh, Alicia is a seasoned government affairs and public policy professional who's been working for a long time with the Bauer Group. I think probably to many of our, our, our listeners and watchers today, the Bauer Group will, will need no introduction. They've been among the most proactive and leading private sector firms uh, in the region. Uh, and, and they have a range of expertises. In particular, Alicia has deep expertise in helping companies forge meaningful relationships with government to create real value to the economy and the benefit Indonesians. Uh, she's got specific sectorial expertise in the financial sector, uh, ranging from banking to payment to fintech, insurance, microlending, et cetera. Um, I will note that she has a Bachelor of Arts degrees from, from Monash University. Uh, we just so that the, we're clear here, the West Australian virtual border, borders are well open, not just to Indonesia, but also to our friends who have been in Victoria. Uh, and she's got a, an MBA from the, uh, the Venus Business School. Before I go to, to Alicia for her opening comments, I'm going to actually invite Minister Tinley to join me here if I could. Um, and I'll introduce him first for some opening remarks. And Alicia, then we're going to come to you. Um, this entire enterprise that we've been engaged in really is the brainchild of Minister Peter Tinley. Uh, Minister Peter Tinley, AM, MLA is the West Australian Minister for Asian Engagement. He has been a member of the Western Australian State Parliament for 10 years, since 2010. He's the member for Willergy. He had a distinguished 25-year career in the Australian military, specifically in the SASR. Uh, and I would note that, if I understand correctly, uh, when at his direction, the, as a member of the opposition, Western Australia established a position of a shadow Minister for Asian Engagement, it was the only such position uh, in the entire country of Australia. And for having him fill that role here in the state government today, it's a great honor for us to continue to work with him, not just this year, but last year and the year before, and in many other projects we've got. I'm gonna turn the time over to Minister Tinley for some brief opening remarks, after which I'm gonna to return to you, Alicia, for, you, for your comments. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, a member of our, our panel, 
and the Connors uh, from, from the Australian Financial Review will have a broader conversation. But without further ado, for those of you watching, uh, it's my great honor today to be joined by Minister Peter Tindley. So, Peter. Hey, thank you, Gordon. It's a little pleasure to be here. And hello, everyone online. Uh, well, these are different times. Uh, the fact that uh, we are meeting in such a fashion, I think, is testament to resilience, I suppose, and, and capacity for, um, well, the international community uh, and people who are interested and motivated by this, these sorts of things, to just find different ways to get it done. Um, so, as Gordon said, uh, and I'm very grateful for him and Perth Euro Asia Centre uh, being available to actually assist Western Australia to maintain its international connections and opportunities, um, and indeed grow them. Um, we, we developed the Asian engagement uh, idea in opposition. And so opposition has been one of those cold, dark places, if you like, where you have to come up with innovative ways to reinvent your game. And that's what we've been able to do. Uh, so we decided when we come to government, we wanted to have a, a cabinet level representation of uh, the Asian opportunity for Western Australia. So very provincial and, and unashamedly so talking about our time zone. And that is that, that from where we sit here in Perth, uh, three and five hours flight north into our time zone represents one of the, to me, uh, some of the golden opportunities for successive generations in Western Australia to find sustainable jobs. And, and it's great pride that I, I am one of, the, one of the first Asian engagement ministers of any state. The, uh, the real challenge for us though, in these current environments is to maintain the connection with both our partners, uh, uh, internationally, but certainly are developing new markets. One of the strategies of the West Australian government is to diversify the economy. Uh, you cannot diversify your economy without diversifying your markets. And so uh, it's been some pleasure that we've been sort of, before COVID, we've been working our way through the sister state relationships that we have around the region, uh, principally East Java, for example, 30 year anniversary of that relationship and making sure that we're, uh, we're really really helping uh, in developing or assisting that those authorities there developing the economies and opportunities there, but also looking for opportunities for West Australian businesses. Very proud, and we did this all virtually, I suppose, after a visit last April into Vietnam, uh, we were recently be able to sort of culminate that activity with a uh, memorandum of understanding with a province in the south called Bare Vung Tau, and, uh, and there's very much a focused MOU that will identify the opportunities around uh, some of the, the key industries that Western Australia has to offer. So these are the sorts of examples, if you like, where we're trying to really uh, live the, un the idea of the Asian engagement strategy that we have, um, but also looking for inbound investment. So part of what we're doing, and the Asian dialogue is so important to it, keeping those connections, part of what we're doing is making sure that people understand in the, in the regions about what the opportunity is in Western Australia, both biosecure now and um, and also particularly in some of the products that we produce uh, that are um, attending to what is a growing consumer taste for understanding the provenance of where, where things come from, both in a, um, you know, in a biosecurity sort of sense, but also in a, in a qualitative sense of how the jurisdictions operate. So look, really proud and of what we've achieved so far, so much more to go. Uh, we're in the midst of this pandemic, uh, hopefully, um, we're past halfway, but I don't think anybody who would bet would say that we're anywhere we are on a timeline. Um, so we're really looking forward to continuing this and really exploiting the opportunities that we have with each other to make sure that we're growing together. Thanks, Gordon. Well, thank you, Minister Tinley. Um, together with Minister Tinley, his colleagues, and with the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science, and Innovation, what we've done is we've put together five different sessions this week uh, focus on different topics. And today is focused on WA ASEAN economic partnerships and post COVID recovery. Uh, because given how much our economy here in Western Australia and in Australia more broadly has been it, based on a foundation of open trade and investment, uh, it's clear that any recovery from COVID uh, that is in our interest as well as in the interest in our partners within ASEAN relies on us reestablishing that connectivity. And again, I've already given an introduction to, to Ms. Alicia Solisto from the, the Bauer Group Asia. She's gonna to present today on the economic state of ASEAN and opportunities for Western Australia to connect with Southeast Asia post COVID. 
so Alicia, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we'll turn the time over to you for your initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon, for your um, kind introduction. Um, you know, I wanted to speak a bit today about the economic state of play in Southeast Asia and how it relates to the mammoth in the room, the pandemic. I think we've heard uh, both Gordon and Minister Tinley mention the pandemic more than twice or three times, right? And I think we can all collectively agree that the past 11 months have been unprecedented in so many ways, not only testing the resilience of many nations, but also forcing a lot of governments to confront realities of weak healthcare systems, fragile social protection, and exacerbated inequality at an expedited pace. Now, when talking about the current economic state of play and its eventual recovery, I think it would be very difficult to assess without observing a country's handling of the pandemic. The title of the session Gordon mentioned assumes opportunities in a world post-COVID. So to get there, a government's management of the pandemic becomes very crucial. What I wanted to do this afternoon is talk briefly about the different approaches governments around ASEAN have taken to handling the pandemic and how it'll affect its economic recovery. And most importantly, focus on the one country that's considered the odd one out, but also happens to be its largest economy, Indonesia. Because ultimately, I believe the resolution of the pandemic, our ability to return to some semblance of normalcy will have enormous impact on opportunities present for Western Australian businesses. Now looking at Southeast Asia as a region, its handling of the pandemic can be characterized as surprisingly well managed. Compared to regions like Europe or Latin America, there are only about 1 million reported cases out of a population of around 670 million people. Now granted low testing in countries like Timor-Leste, Cambodia and Laos may have skewed these results. But even in countries with significant testing, such as Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam, positivity re rate remains well below the WHO standard of 5%. We also see countries like Vietnam and Singapore returning to normalcy by opening up its economy cautiously. Vietnam's economic growth is also forecasted to rebound at about 6.5% for 2021, which is well above the global average. Thailand, despite tumultuous political unrest and low testing, has also been able to contain the pandemic through strict mobility restrictions. Malaysia and Singapore's stop-start approach to lockdowns, implementing circuit breakers, and aggressive testing and tracing, I think have also worked very well in containing cases. Now what this means is the ability of these economies to recoup its people's purchasing power, its consumer confidence, its tourism sector, and ramping up other engines of growth that may have grinded to a halt because of the pandemic will be expedited. Indonesia, however, has not fared as well as its neighbors. Although it hasn't attracted the international media coverage of countries such as Brazil, or India about its handling of the pandemic, worrying statistics like the average daily growth of cases, its sky high positivity rate, very low testing capacity, and low tracing ratio suggest that Indonesia can easily overtake many countries in Europe or Latin America if it continues on its current trajectory. As an example, the tracing ratio of Indonesia is three. This means that for every positive case found, only three other people who have been in contact with that person are tracked and traced. WHO standard is 30, and Singapore's rate is at 70, to give a bit of a comparison. Indonesia has also only tested 1.2% of its population and its daily average testing is well below WHO's 
suggested minimum of 38,500 tests. Now, yes, Indonesia's population is the largest in ASEAN, and other countries like Thailand and Vietnam do have similar testing capacities. But the question is, how has it reached such different outcomes? Well, for one, Indonesia's inconsistent messaging about the severity of the virus and the unwillingness to take any strict public health measures has not helped. The rationale is fairly simple. Government fears any aggressive public health measures to contain the virus, such as lockdowns, limited opening of businesses, strict mobility restrictions, will create enormous socioeconomic damages and social unrest. But what we've learned from other countries' approaches, in Southeast Asia especially, or Australia for that matter, is that it's not a zero-sum game. There can be compromise. But instead of employing this approach, it seems Indonesia has jumped straight to a foregone conclusion that a vaccine will be the ultimate solution and dismiss any mitigation efforts in the meantime. What Indonesia has been focused on in the meantime, in line with its efforts to expedite economic recovery, is President Jokowi's original diagnosis when he took office back in 2014. The diagnosis is that Indonesia is simply not competitive enough and that this has been the primary cause of its plateaued growth and low levels of foreign direct investment compared to its regional competitors such as Thailand and Vietnam. The prescription to this diagnosis, President Jokowi believes, is pursuit of numerous free trade agreements and most importantly, pushing unprecedented investment reforms through a legislative product model from, among others, Australia. The Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or IACPA, and the passage of the Omnibus Law are two of the biggest efforts governments recently implemented to attract more foreign direct investment. As we all know, IACPA was signed in January 2019 and ratified 12 months after, which cemented a new milestone in Indonesia and Australia's bilateral relationship. IACPA is quite unprecedented for Indonesia as it focuses on development of human capital as a focal point of the trade relationship, emphasizing on skills development through education and vocational training. Now, as Indonesia becomes increasingly nervous about its demographic bonus, improvement of human capital is imperative and government sees IACPA as a driver to achieving these goals. One early manifestation of this is President Jokowi's announcement of an Australian university becoming the first fully foreign-owned university to establish a campus in Indonesia. This, annou this announcement was made back in February when he visited Canberra and had an audience with the parliament. This was historic, considering that the higher education sector in Indonesia has been close to foreign investment for 75 years, or for as long as Indonesia has been independent. IACPA has been in effect since July 5th, and a lot of implementing regulations remain to be issued. But I see that the agreement is shaping up to be one of the most significant trade agreements Indonesia ratified in recent history. In addition, the long-awaited omnibus law often touted as the big bang of, ref of reforms for Indonesia's investment climate, was finally passed last month after years of deliberation. After much digestion, I think the consensus is that the law may result in some investment climate improvements, and the law is certainly a step in the right direction. Like the IACPA though, contingent upon careful study of its implementing regulations. But what I see, and I think what we have to give the Indonesian government credit for, is its attempt to address longstanding complaints of foreign companies, foreign chambers of commerce, 
embassies, organizations such as the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and others. But the law was drafted and passed to address problems in a pre-pandemic world. Expensive labor costs, complicated licensing procedures, difficult land acquisition, high corporate tax rates. These are issues that do contribute to companies' reluctance to invest in Indonesia, but I think it is now overshadowed by the issues aggravated by the pandemic. Transparency of data, mitigation efforts, willingness to listen to scientists, all these will be detrimental to Indonesia's attractiveness to investors and the speed of its eventual economic rebound. So the question I think on everybody's mind is, so what does this mean in real terms for Western Australian businesses seeking to capitalize on opportunities in Indonesia and the region? Well, for one, Indonesia's approach meant that they avoided the deep, sharp contractions Vietnam and Thailand experienced. But if the country does not turn a corner very soon, its eventual recovery will lag behind the collective rebound of the region. It will likely be the last country in the region to reestablish air linkages, which has immediate consequences for doing business. From simply being able to travel for meetings to the ability to physically survey locations for huge decisions. Air travel, tourism, and other industries which underpin Western Australia and Indonesia's close relationship will be slow to rebound. I think Western Australian companies would even need to reconcile with the imminent reality that it simply won't be safe to travel to Indonesia, even after it's safe to travel to Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and other countries in the region. Nonetheless, I think companies will stay engaged, but a lot of commercial relationships will be slower to restart than other parts of the region. Through the course of my work, I've seen many companies continue to exhibit heightened interest in Indonesia, despite circumstances surrounding the pandemic. However, one red thread that I've found is that existing investments will fare better under the current set of reforms and conditions, as the reforms are still not bold enough for new investors carefully considering opportunities in the region. And so the reality is, I think Indonesia needs to be very clear-eyed on whether they'll be able to position itself ahead of, of its regional competitors. If it does not couple its efforts to improve attractiveness, with containing the pandemic anytime soon. Because it took so long for Indonesia to secure even modest reforms, and the health crisis had only underscored urgency to take even braver steps. So in a world where there's heightened competitiveness in the region, I worry that the political capital spent by the Indonesian government won't produce the return on investment the government so de desperately wants. And with that, Gordon, I turn the floor back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alicia. That was a, a sobering, but also extremely informative. And, and you're absolutely correct. You can't understand uh, a, a post-COVID uh, recovery uh, and whatever opportunities might exist in that post-COVID recovery without understanding the strategies that are necessary to lead to that post-COVID recovery. You did remind me that uh, in, in uh, February, I was fortunate enough to be in Canberra and attend not only the speech by President Jokowi to the parliament, but also the luncheon that was held in Parliament House. And I had forgotten because that seems like it was a decade ago already <laughs> between now and February. Well, we're very fortunate to have someone here to help us remember probably more than I've, I've forgotten in many respects. Uh, we've got a Emma Connors, who's the Southeast Asia correspondent for the Australian Financial Review, who's agreed to join us as a member of a panel discussion, but also to give some initial reactions to the remarks that we heard from Alicia. Uh, Emma has three decades of experience in journalism. She's been with the Australian Financial Review for over 18 years. 
She spent two years uh, with the Lowy Institute as writing the interpreter, one of the most influential publications that coming out of the Australian think tank community uh, and is supposed to be in Jakarta right now. <laughs> but I think after hearing the, the descriptions uh, so, so soberingly laid out by Alicia, it seems like she might be in Sydney for a little bit longer. But Emma, thank you for your time. We'd like to, to turn it over to you for your initial reactions on, on Alicia's uh, presentation and the topic. And then hopefully you can stay and join Peter, Alicia and I for a broader conversation. Emma, to you. Sure, sure. thanks very much. Well, thanks Gordon and thanks Alicia. I think, you know, we don't know enough about um, what's happening on the ground at Indonesia. I'm working with the local journalists there, but with just so much um, pandemic news, I think sometimes it does get lost, particularly the differentiation between Indonesia's approach to the pandemic and what's happened in other countries um, that are sort of favoured destinations of Australia, like Thailand and Vietnam. Just like to take up on, I'll perhaps discuss two um, points that you made. One, um, IAC, but I think, you know, we sometimes do lose sight of what a big deal this was, particularly for Indonesia. You know, Australian governments as a trading nation, we have really seen a free trade deal we don't like, I think, you know. I mean, if you look at the history, we tend to collect them um, very, very enthusiastically. But it was such a big deal in Indonesia. And even, you know, towards the very last, you know, it was still, a, a, took a great act of political will to get it through the parliament. There was still quite a bit of resistance, um, given the size of the, the, or the size of the trading relationship um, Indonesia has with Australia and the fact that, you know, they buy a lot more of our stuff than we do of theirs. So I think it was, it was an immense achievement. And we are seeing um, some positive uh, benefits flowing from that. You know, you mentioned Monash University and their planned postgraduate facility. We know that planning is, is still going ahead. And just this week, we're um, reporting the financial review about a big healthcare deal, which I think is really exciting because it sort of demonstrates, again, that sort of capital, um, human capital development side. So it's two Australian companies, Aspen Medical and Sydney's Doctor, who are going to sign with the West Java government this week to um, hopefully in coming years, provide 6,000 more beds in hospitals um, and work with the local medical workforce there. So I think, you know, these, these type of um, emerging deals are really exciting. And I guess give a sort of tantalizing glimpse of what the Indonesia-Australia relationship could develop into. Um, you know, I have a lot of admiration for people um, like the minister who have devoted you know, a lot of energy into uh, trying to get this relationship to come along. It, it's, it's, it's not easy that we are two very different countries, which of course is a truism, but there is a lot of goodwill. But, you know, you, you look at these sort of shining lights and then, you know, you realise just the difficulties involved in every single trade still, you know. Um, you know, we wrote a story recently about how Aussie table grape growers missed out on quite a lot of trade earlier this year because quotas weren't issued in time by the Indonesian government. Um, and I noticed that our minister has spoken hopefully about how IACPA will prevent that type of thing or make it sort of less, less common. So certainly that's something we can all hope for. And I think, you know, it's important to to continue to progress those conversations, but we also need to look at this very stark reality of what the pandemic is doing to Indonesia at this point. And I'm very encouraged recently by the federal government's moves in that area. You know, for a while we were leaving the running on vaccine and pandemic diplomacy completely to China, um, which has, you know, been very quick to offer um, vaccine trials to Indonesia and to guarantee supply of these still as midly unproven vaccines. But certainly, you know, it was really in there from the beginning. And I remember speaking to um, Indonesia's foreign minister back in April, and she spoke to me about the importance of vaccine diplomacy then. So it was once again, a, a sort of a telling sign of how far sighted some people are. And now, you know, you see that Australia is beginning, but we're sort of a bit late to the party. You know, there is a loan, it was finalised last week 
and we're sort of given some more money to COVAX, but I think we, we really need to step up in that area or else, you know, it's, it's a, it'll be a missed opportunity, I guess. Well, thank you. We're going to transition now into a broader kind of panel conversation because there's an awful lot that's already been discussed. But before we do that, uh, Minister Chinley, I want to turn to you. If there's any reactions you had to the initial remarks by, by Alicia or, or, or by Amber, uh, and I, before that, I'm going to jump into a series of questions of conversation. Any thoughts that you had? Uh, no, well, uh, as always in these things, uh, Gordon, I'm more informed than when I walked in. Um, and thank you very much to, to those two contributions. And um, your point Emma, about uh, vaccine diplomacy is not lost. Um, one of the features we've seen in, in Australian politics now is the advent of this thing called the National Cabinet. And, and that has, uh, in my view, overtaken COAG and you'll be very unlikely to see it returning to, to that sort of format again. But through that process, we've, uh, the Premier has been able to get to know both the other state leaders and of course the Prime Minister quite well. And as a result, has been able to carry messages just on a range of ways. And these sort of topics often get uh, raised around how we're actually continuing to, in a difficult set of circumstances, engage with our, our biggest near neighbour. Uh, and, and one, quite frankly, we should have a, um, a relationship with closer than probably any other country, in my view, but that's a personal view. And certainly one we're working towards uh, in Western Australia and taking the responsibility seriously of being the sole representative of the Commonwealth and the Indian Ocean, you know, and the nearest neighbour to Indonesia to make sure that we're doing that. So things like COVID diplomacy uh, are matters that are active conversations, uh, um, you know, and hopefully we can see the opportunity through a crisis like COVID to actually in enhance our relationships uh, rather than, um, you know, actually potentially see the risk, I suppose, that we've all seen globally where a sort of a retreat to isolationism, mm -hmm. nationalism, and all that, that, that comes with that in terms of a challenge. Uh, now more than ever is the time to be fighting for globalization mm -hmm. uh, than ever before. And you're both very good exponents of that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we, we, we stay on Indonesia for a little bit, and then we're gonna just move and talk a little bit more broadly about ASEAN. Um, uh, Alicia, you mentioned a demographic bonus. Uh, Indonesia, obviously, uh, is not just our nearest neighbor, but it's our largest neighbor, uh, right next door in, in what, 275, almost 280 million people right now. And one of the things that I've experienced in the last seven years of engagement between the Perth US Asia Center and Indonesia is that whenever you deal at the top with government ministers, and, and a lot of what you were describing was, was the current performance of the current government, there, there's inevitably a large degree of frustration in terms of pace and timing. Whenever you deal with the kind of the rising generation, there's this bubbling optimism because there's so much going on there. The last two years that Minister Tinley and we have done this WA ASEAN Trade Investment Dialogue, I think come the, the most inspirational thing about it really was that rising generation. So I wonder if I might go back to you to talk a little bit about how the, the pandemic is impacting that generation, how they're adapting to it, mm. Uh, and then I want to come back to you, Emma, on this, because obviously your reporting has, has clearly focused on some of that. And then maybe Minister Chinley might reflect on our, our rising generation here in WA as well. So, Alicia. Yeah. Um, thanks, Gordon. That, that's a really interesting question, right? Because uh, I might consider myself maybe at the tail end of that rising <laughs> generation. But, um, you know, these, um, I think government has co-opted the rising generation and rebranded them as millennials, right? We've actually seen uh, specific millennials being appointed as uh, special advisors to the president, for example. So I think government does acknowledge that um, this age group uh, will be a very significant force, both in politics and business for years to come. Now, in terms of how, um, how this generation has adapted to pandemic, I think my sense is that um, because they were brought up in, a, in an environment that encourages a bit more critical thinking perhaps, they've actually been a bit more cautious and questioning about um, government's um, policies that are coming out uh, during the pandemic. So for example, um, the passage of the omnibus law uh, or before that was um, some other questionable le legislation actually resulted in huge waves of, um, of student protests and demonstrations. 
so it, it goes to show right there, they are a, a very significant political force um, and that they're a lot more critical, I think right now of, of what government policies are uh, and not taking it at face value. So um, in terms of, of, um, of what I see the future of uh, Indonesia as this huge demographic, supposedly productive, the most productive workforce uh, will be heavily dependent, I think, upon uh, Indonesia's ability to also attract more foreign investment that will result in a lot more quality jobs, right? Because the flip side of um, reforming education, which I think Indonesia is uh, uh, attempting to do by inviting you know, foreign universities, universities such as Monash, is that you need to be able to create the jobs to and then to actually uh, accommodate uh, all these graduates that are coming out of universities and better quality other, and other better quality education institutions. Thank so you. So those are my two cents, Gordon. Thank you, Emma. Any, any comments on that? Uh, sure. Just a couple of um, observations, I guess. I speak occasionally to um, Santiago Uno, the former vice president. Um, candidate who will not rule out running um, again um, in politics, like no one in Indonesia will ever rule out running again in politics, I think. But he has a very, so he's a former investment banker, very successful, and he has a very um, interesting sort of network of, you know, he sort of acts as a bit like sort of incubator mentor to lots of um, sort of young tech startups. And, you know, he did this fantastic thing. Well, they did this fantastic thing of sort of marshalling um, those startups and his other networks to provide quite a lot of private sector support, um, particularly when there were, you know, the, Jakarta never had proper lockdowns, but certainly there was the um, social restrictions in where a lot of people um, were, had quite a tough time because they couldn't go outside and earn their money. And they had amazing support from the private sector um, for the very community level um, organisations, which really are sort of the guts of most Indonesians' neighbourhoods, I think. So I thought that was just a really nice sort of marshalling of those mm. very creative um, thinkers to deal with a very clear and current crisis. But Thank on you. the not so bright side, um, we've also heard a lot of young entrepreneurs who um, have suffered from, you know, a lack of customers, a lack of consumption, the GDP is obviously now in recession, and they have found it difficult to access some of the government's promised um, financial support from the government in terms of loan relief and other payments, although I think that might have improved in recent weeks, but certainly, you know, it was just very creaky wheels to get that all moving. Mr. Tenley, many of your efforts have been inspiring the younger generation, not only here, but in the region. Um, yeah, it's so important you know, to us, Gordon. In fact, I, I don't think Western Australia will truly embrace its uh, its opportunity in our region uh, with the current generation, me included. Um, it, it is all going to be delivered by people who see see the vision for themselves and where their opportunities, both on the demand side, if you like, from the market, uh, and also from our side as the supply side. And one of the things we're seeing, and which is so important in the people to people relationships, is in our business councils for the various uh, uh, relevant countries. So uh, our arrangements for the, you know, um, ACBC, for example, the Australian, uh, China um, business council, and, and uh, um, with Indonesia, in the, in the similarly in those councils, they're very activated by, by younger generations. I'm really looking forward to those people coming on and taking on those roles, both in their private life, in, in, in the various enterprises they work with, but also collectively through these business councils is really very important. They've, they are the ones that actually are energising the arrangement. So, and what we're also seeing in some of these places, a lot of these young uh, Western Australian or Australian Indonesian, if you like, or Australian Vietnamese uh, people, generations sort of under 40, um, they're, they're not afraid about moving you know, back to, um, even the ones born here, moved in, into Indonesia, or in this case, say Vietnam, where I have a personal experience with some of them, and actually take up the opportunities there, and they're actually bicultural in their in their approach. And so, in in uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, last year, we ran into a group of young Australians, all Vietnamese Australians, who are saw the opportunity through their their 
familial links uh, and have gone in, back into Vietnam or gone to Vietnam for the first time, some of them, and are very entrepreneurial and they get both sides of it. And so they're the ones that are going to deliver the opportunities into the future. I'm really excited for them. I would note here, for those of you who aren't aware, just last month, uh, the, the minister, Minister Chin Lee, uh, participated in a virtual launching of a, a, a new sister state relationship or a memorandum of understanding between Western Australia and Malia Vung Tau province, uh, which is something really lo worth looking at, primarily because of the, the younger demographic there mm. that's driving that. If I can just add two things to this conversation, because I think it's quite interesting, without taking away at all from the real concern that Emma mentioned, uh, those young entrepreneurs who have lost customers and are struggling in, in this current environment, at the same time, my guess is that the younger generation of Indonesians and Southeast Asian more broadly are far more tech savvy than even a lot of us here are. Uh, and so if I look back at the last you know, six months, so much more interaction is taking place via Zoom and other formats than we ever had before. And I'm reminded of two things. Number one, uh, we hosted a, a, a series of both a round table and then an interview with uh, Australia's High Commissioner to India, Barry O'Farrell. Uh, and as he ended up his remarks, he, he really laid down a gauntlet. He, he mentioned that uh, he had arrived in India just as the pandemic was taking off. So he was the first person in history to have to present his, his credentials virtually. Uh, and he went on his, basically his entire tenure as ambassador, as high commissioner had been virtual. And so he realized that today, people are more willing to engage this way than they ever were in the past. And so we have no excuse just to wait. You know, actually the barriers to building relationships between youth groups like the Australia ASEAN uh, Youth Strategic Leadership Dialogue, which I'm speaking to on Saturday, they're really impressive. Uh, if you go back to our website, you'll see that we had a great interview with Haley Winchcombe and some of her colleagues, that the work they're doing is really good. The other thing I'll note here is that for the last five years, uh, we've collaborated together with the Foreign Policy Community Indonesia, FPCI. This is a former ambassador, Dino Patti Jalal's group. And uh, his conferences, he builds them as the largest foreign policy conference in the world. They're kind of a mix between a policy conference and a rock concert because there's five to 10,000 young energetic students in the room. Uh, this year, it's not happening in person. Instead, we and many other organizations are supporting what, what it's been called the global town hall. Uh, and it's an interesting to see those innovations being led in Indonesia and for me, uh, it's been very interesting to see the level of global interest. So everything that, Alicia, you said, despite that, everything, uh, the concerns that Emma laid out despite that, because of demographics, there remains and will always remain this intense interest in Indonesia because, uh, to use the old quote, demography is destiny in that regard. So let me do one more question on Indonesia, and then we're going to turn to Asia more broadly. Both Emma and uh, Alicia, you brought up IHEPA or IASEPA, the Australia-Indonesia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, the omnibus law, which is kind of related to that. These are, these are pre, during, and then post-COVID underlying environmental, business environmental issues are really important. Uh, these have become important to WA, you know, as uh, this year has also not just seen uh, a global pandemic, but we've had a very real trade war going on with our largest trade partner in China which has had arguably a disproportionate impact here in Western Australia, in grains, in barley, in, 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 in crayfish, et cetera. It's been interesting that a lot of those things have provisions under IHEPA that allow us to begin to seek to do what we've long sought to do, which is diversify. So I wanna go back to the omnibus law to IHEPA uh, and, and ask you going forward, uh, you've done a pretty, pretty good job of explaining where we are right now. Going forward, what should people who are watching this today be focused on if, if they really want to take full advantage of IHEPA, of the omnibus law, and other regulations that are taking place underneath the pandemic? Alicia, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, thanks, Gordon. So I think, uh, you know, both IACPA and the omnibus law, like I mentioned, um, its full impact won't be felt until we have all these implementing regulations in place. So like Emma mentioned, there was an issue about quota, uh, grapes quota, if I'm not mistaken, and that could actually be resolved once, for example, an implementing regulation from the Ministry of Trade is in place. But in terms of what people or what businesses 
um, should be looking forward to um, to create a lot more impact for the relationship. I think the two biggest uh, the two biggest sectors would definitely be education and healthcare um, because these unfortunately were not the focal point of Indonesia's state budget for 2021. Yes, they have increased the budget somewhat, um, but not at the levels that it's needed to actually, um, I think, rebound significantly after the pandemic. Because what the pandemic has actually exposed um, are extremely uh, apparent shortcomings in these two sectors, right? Uh, especially with the demographic demographic bonus coming up. So I think healthcare and education would definitely be a sector to watch out. And, you know, fortunately enough, IEC actually addresses both um, these sectors. Thank you. Emma, any, any reactions to you? Yeah, sure. Like just a couple of um, interesting stories, I guess, that I've picked up. Um, when I was still in, in Indonesia, um, there was this sort of fascinating tit for tat going on with the European Union. You know, there was a bit of a uh, disagreement uh, about palm oil. And what that meant was there was sort of a very quiet, um, unspoken, uh, not quite a ban, but a reluctance to buy too much European wine. We spoke to quite a few uh, restaurants in Jakarta who said the Australian wine was going gangbusters because, you know, there was no problems getting hold of the different uh, quotas and tariffs that they needed. So I think what that showed to me was, A, you know, it's interesting how um, one trade spat can benefit someone else, but it also just shows, you know, those enduring relationships. Like, you know, we met um, one of the wine wholesalers who was having a tasting with a guy who was representing a couple of, you know, quite small Australian wine companies. And they all, you know, did, did very well out of sort of being there when the opportunity arose. Um, and as, you know, anyone who has done a lot of time with Indonesia knows, you know, you really need those personal relationships, uh, what really makes business roll. Um, and I think that's something that we have to remember because it's not the same in Australia, where it can all be done sort of very, you know, officially with emails and all the rest of it. Um, of course, you know, the pandemic, but that still means, you know, you actually have to know the person um, you're doing business with and invest that time, and then you can get those benefits. And I think, you know, we're now seeing some um, wheat producers sort of diversifying a bit with IAC for coming on board and different opportunities opening up. So once again, they're sort of building on those established relationships they have in Indonesia. Thanks, Minister Tinley. Obviously, uh, IHEPA and the omnibus rule are federal government things, but they do have an impact on WA as a state. Any reactions from you? Yeah, I, th I think it's really important that, particularly, obviously, we deal with the, at the enterprise level here in the, in, the, in the provinces, where we're actually working with the various businesses, big and small, to see where the opportunities are and unpacking some of these opportunities and, until we see the full regulatory effect, if you like, of, of IHEPA being distributed out. We're still going to have these sort of challenges, but businesses are very active towards it. I think also in the COVID, you can't get away from COVID and the COVID implications. I think there needs to be a lot more work and there's probably a government led thing here about the, the changes to uh, both distribution systems within uh, Indonesia, um, what's deteriorated, they're made up of a lot of small to medium businesses as well. Uh, what's changed about that? What's likely to come back? Is, the, is, is that supply and distribution system going to markedly change how that worked within Indonesia. And I think it's really important that trying to get scale right through that system as well and get, uh, get sustainability. The, the other aspect here is, is around um, understanding global supply chains and how they're, they're changing. Every business mm -hmm. here in Western Australia, the large ones doing the resource sector, massive multinational businesses are all examining their supply chain from a COVID risk perspective and saying, how do we shorten those? How do we do them more locally or just in time? And so Western Australian businesses and Indonesian businesses, uh, I think we'll need to reassess how that supply chain works. I think the actual architecture and the features of it won't necessarily change, but companies that are the main prime provider may actually move closer to their big customers. Um, but what we need to do is take advantage of that. And this is where the young generation sees it as well, is that 
taking up that uh, South Korean sort of thing or hidden heroes where they, they find people, they find parts of the supply chain that they become essential for and then not try and make the vehicle or the car or whatever it might be, but make the essential components of it in a manufacturing context that works in the service sector as well. So I think that we're yet to see where it all lands in relation to the, to the nature of supply chains and whether they're going to be shortened and how they're going to be uh, delivered and also the distribution systems in markets are really something we've really got to get to, to grips with. Fantastic. I want to come back to that question of supply chains, but I thought first what we might do is, is take this conversation now for the next few minutes a little bit more broadly. Uh, we, we've spent most of our time thus far talking about our, our both our nearest and our largest neighbor in terms of Indonesia and its economy. And it's big, but it's obviously not representative of all of, of ASEAN. Uh, and so Alicia, in your opening remarks, you made uh, reference to some other countries that actually have had a much more successful you know, experience, not dealing with COVID, but in the early recovery. So whether it's Vietnam or Singapore or Malaysia, et cetera. So I thought I might start with you, Emma, this time around. Uh, I, I understand that at, the, at the, the AFR that you're not just the Indonesia correspondent, you're the Southeast Asia correspondent. So it's a much broader remit. What are the stories that you're following that perhaps you know, people who are watching this video today should be paying more attention to, the, but they're not? What are the things that are happening underneath the, the broader narrative of the pandemic in Southeast Asia that West Australians in particular should, should focus upon? Sure. Well, I think there's sort of a one neat shorthand um, that you can use to understand where countries are at in terms of the pandemic, and that's in terms of uh, what, what, how they're managing their borders. So we're now beginning to see some countries um, opening up. You know, we're seeing a few travel bubbles. I particularly look at Singapore in this respect. Now, Singapore um, was early held on as, you know, a real uh, success story for managing the pandemic. Then they had these terrible outbreaks in their migrant workers' dormitories that, you know, were tens of thousands of cases. But they are on top of those now, and it's just um, incredible how fast they are now moving. They have an arrangement with Australia. You can actually fly to Singapore as an Australian and not have to quarantine. I mean, of course, you know, there's always the caveats with tests at either side. But I think that just shows that the Singaporean economy, which has been hit quite hard in terms of um, the GDP, is going back by double digits, I think, in the second, first and second quarter. But that, like Australia, is you know, a country that's totally dependent on trade. So it's moving very swiftly. Now it can. Um, and the, if you look at Thailand, which is beginning to open up for some tourism and Vietnam, which is doing the same. Once again, that sort of demonstrates those countries are on top of the pandemic. Um, the other big story, of course, that one needs to be aware of in Thailand is what's happening with the student protests there, which is just such a fascinating story. Uh, you know, it's just incredible. For seven centuries, no one's questioned the Thai monarchy and suddenly you've got these school kids out on the streets. You know, there's a group of them called Bad School at school students it's just and there are so many of them it's just a fascinating development and once again it's a demographic story right it's these really bright kids who are challenging what lies ahead and it's also an economic story in terms of the thai economy wasn't in great shape before the pandemic hit and it was indeed hit quite hard they had very severe lockdowns and these kids are worried about their jobs so they're challenging <laughs> the king um, who has taken control of quite a lot of money. But I think if you look at which countries are opening up and when and how, that gives you an idea of how ready they are to get back to business. Alicia, I realize that you're based in Jakarta, but there's probably no single firm that has a broader reach of or deeper understanding of Southeast Asia as a region than the Bauer Group Asia. Uh, what are you hearing from your colleagues? What, what are the developments that you think West Australian businesses should be paying attention to uh, if we're looking ahead at, at uh, 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 expanding our relationship uh, in, in Southeast Asia? Yeah, well, I think um, one of the trends that I've seen even before the pandemic, at the start of the trade war with China, for example, was companies realized that they needed to diversify very quickly, as Minister Timmy alluded to, right? Um, that includes supply chains, that also includes um, their consumer base itself, 
uh, and trying to tap into markets that they traditionally wouldn't have thought of. But um, you know, with the with the uh, victory of um, Joe Biden, for example, in the U.S., a lot of people are then speculating whether or not these companies would still continue um, to uh, to consider relocation if the trade war with China would, were to die down. But I think because of the pandemic, this will continue on. The, the realization that you do need to diversify uh, and you need to move closer to your consumer base, I think will be an eventuality. Um, and it's not something that will be um, backtracked just because of the trade war with China dying down. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing, as, as Emma mentioned, you know, a lot of these countries are already opening up travel bubbles or travel corridors, uh, if you were a closer neighbor. Well, Indonesia <laughs> will for sure be the last one to be in that bubble if we continue on this current trajectory. Mm -hmm. So again, that will definitely have real implications to business, right? Um, the tourism will basically be paralyzed uh, mm -hmm. I think for the foreseeable future, future until uh, they, they have the uh, pandemic managed, basically. Well, Alicia, I think we've just set a new record. We have gone for almost an hour in our discussion thus far, uh, and probably yeah. for the first time of any panel anywhere in the world, the name Joe Biden was mentioned before the name of his erstwhile competitor. And that's just something <laughs> I've never experienced for a year and a half. So congratulations. Well done. Uh, Thank you. Tindley. It's a good yeah. record to set. Yeah. It is indeed. Um, you, you mentioned supply chains earlier. Both, both Emma and Alicia have kind of commented on, on the, the importance of reestablishing connectivity, not just with Indonesia, but the region more broadly. Obviously, borders are a, a national thing, but WA does have some unique experience in recent days. Absolutely. The, the, this is this challenge for, for, for political uh, leadership everywhere in the world is about how do, you, uh, how do you manage your economy in the midst of something that can kill it? Um, and so we're trying to balance the, the, the first order of business of any government is to keep its community safe, its citizens safe, um, and, and that's there. But uh, to actually manage that, you've got to uh, kill your own economy. And I've got to say, some of these decisions, and I wouldn't be the only one, um, we went to sort of our cabinet meetings, like various executives around the world and around at, at subnational jurisdictions as well, has had to go to work and make decisions that actually end people's jobs. Um, one day in the in the in the pandemic, uh, in the start of the pandemic, when we were in lockdown here in Western Australia, we were going to work thinking, oh yeah, we're going to restrict movement within the state, within the regions of the state. It was something you'd never ever contemplated, but the, by the time you did it. The next day, you'd come back to another cabinet meeting and they say, we didn't go far enough. And, and we never thought we'd ever see that sort of thing before. And what, and what we're finding is that, um, that, that this, this is going to be a lumpy recovery. We, we know that. Um, travel bubbles with various countries is a challenge. We've got a challenge to try and keep the economy moving for jobs. Uh, and I do, I recall one day, uh, and they really challenging things. We went today and we said, no, you can't go to hotels or nightclubs or restaurants. And in one decision, we put 50,000 Western Australians out of work, in one decision. Um, and, and that had consequences like right across the country uh, as every other jurisdiction made those sorts of choices like around the world. Um, but by the same token, we're, we're looking at, uh, from a, a state perspective about where do we, we obviously take the lead from the Commonwealth in relation to the international travel um, we've got this juicy mix at the moment between uh, the state trying to uh, intervene, or if you like, or, or have a, a debate with the Commonwealth about opening international borders because of the issues that I talked about as, as a as subnational jurisdiction trying to keep its people safe. Um, one of the things that we need to do, though, is keep working on the stuff that doesn't seem to get in the in, in into the headlines, like Indonesia, IHF, these sorts of things, and, and the other multilateral architecture that a Joe Biden, we hope, I'll be the second one saying, um, reinvigorates here in our region. And um, Gordon's far more adept, and hopefully you can, Gordon, give us some insight how you think a Biden administration might reinvigorate some of these things and maybe even get involved in RCEP, for example, which has just been recently signed. And we're looking to, 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 to the leadership of, of the US to actually bring together those opportunities. And, and we'll get through this pandemic, but the, the, and these travel bubbles will be lumpy, They'll come, they'll go, 
like we just turned off the border to South Australia today, um, simply because oh, we've, we've imposed a whole bunch of restrictions around it. So um, I don't think it's going to be a smooth, uh, logical glide path out of it, but we will come out of it, it will end, but uh, we can't have wasted our time on the, the architecture that exists that which creates that opportunity. We don't want to be, you can't zoom our way out of this, um, but what you can do is, is, is invest in these things like we're doing today to actually make sure we're not going from a standing start. Sorry, long answer to short. No, no, in fact, if I can chime in on this a little bit, um, um, because of those hard decisions that the minister just talked about that were made not just in Western Australia, but in other states throughout Australia, uh, Australia as a whole, and WA in particular, find ourselves in, in a relatively unique position where globally we have a reputation now as a place that is, is well governed, that is clean, that is safe. And that's on top of the other you know, longstanding advantages that existed in terms of the, the education system and the infrastructure and the rule of law, et cetera. And so part of my, my thinking about this is the next phase, and we're, we've all been talking about it, no one knows exactly how it goes, uh, is, is going to be of one of great potential for us if we play it right. Uh, and that is the traditional destination of uh, students, of tourists, of investors coming out of ASEAN, but even Asia more broadly, has largely been you know, in much larger numbers than for us to the United States, to the UK, to Europe more broadly. And those are all areas, I mean, to put things in context, Alicia has done a very good job of talking about ASEAN and the particular struggles of the largest economy in ASEAN. So if you take that and you put that globally, now the globe is, is, has been rather uneven in responding to this and the largest economy in the United States and collectively the EU has suffered as well. Uh, and if we can take advantage of the tremendous efforts on the state level uh, in terms of figuring out procedures, start, stop, when you do it, when you do it well, and, and then identify that, that and again, maybe this is one of, one of our themes for the last three years, that, that Southeast Asia is not a unitary whole. Uh, and, and both Emma and Alicia made it very clear. There are countries that have extremely well managed this, be it Singapore or be it, if you go more further north into to Korea or Japan or Taiwan in particular, or Vietnam. Uh, and, and so there's an opportunity for us to in, implement best practices in terms of testing, procedure, and travel, uh, where there will be demand here that doesn't, and even for those in Indonesia who may be looking for this type of environment we've got here. So it's gonna be an interesting time. The one thing I think, uh, this may be an interesting time for us to be doing an ASEAN trade investment dialogue when the underlying narrative is, one, we don't know, we don't know it's going to be over, and the impact of COVID is really, really hard, right? That's, our, that's our, our theme here. But at the same time, there should be an, another conclusion we're drawing from the panel thus far, which is that as we do open, and as we start looking for those future jobs, a lot of the areas where they're going to open first are going to be here in our region, right? Uh, and, and so those are the ones we're going to identify. Um, I want to, we've just got a few minutes left, um, and I want to make sure that I get to a couple of other topics. Um, uh, Minister Chen, you talked about supply chains. Um, and, and obviously, those have been really important to the Western Australian economy, uh, and not just our resource sector more broadly. Could you tell us a little bit more about kind of, you, you spearheaded uh, work for the Western Australian government in putting together an, an Asian engagement strategy, mm. which had you made a part of this. Would you take that work now and overlay it to the, the conversation we've just had? That, thanks, Gordon. It, it is, um, and I'm really informed well by your, your comments in relation to um, how we fit in, the, in, this, in this region and where the opportunities lie. And the Asian engagement strategy uh, sits as the umbrella, if you like, that, that creates the architecture, if you like, um, it's not an empty vessel, but uh, all the various strands that they allow uh, other government policy to sit under, underneath. So uh, d diversify uh, uh, Western Australia is a, is a genuine movement down priority sectors to ensure that we're actually in, engaging from an international perspective. So understanding what's happening in these markets is absolutely vital to us. So the Asian engagement strategy uh, is really, if nothing else, it's a, it's a, a statement, uh, both internally with the bureaucracy of, of the West Australian government, but also the private enterprise that we take seriously the opportunity. So much of what government has to do is in its leadership function in the community is point. And 
And what we're finding, um, if I can just segue to this for a little bit, what we we found is that you can go to any number of forums and find out about the opportunity in Asia, you know, the richest time zone in the world and, and Indonesia being the fourth largest economy in, in, in our lifetime. They're all great statements, but what we're finding is the enterprise level, they're going, yep, but tomorrow morning they go back to their business and they go, well, what do I do now? How do I actually, uh, am I export ready? Am I, do I know how to engage with this? So the Asian engagement strategy uh, sits there to actually uh, energize both those business communities, which are made up, but also the people to people sort of groupings that actually come together and say, this is a unifying opportunity for you to, uh, to listen to. So some of the programs that work out underneath this is uh, a grants program, for example, a very small grants program that assists uh, enterprises to actually uh, what we call Access Asia grants, uh, where they've just up to sort of ten and a thousand dollars to actually do investigations and engage somebody to do it because quite often we're finding that people aren't challenged. The other thing that it does, and particularly in the diversification strategy, is actually get Western Australian businesses, and this is a, a thing that any developed country needs to do, in my view, is get those people that compete in the domestic market to actually collaborate to enter another market overseas. Helps de-risk it, um, but uh, you know, it's a bigger pie and they're gonna get a nice piece of it if, if they get it right. So mm. um, understanding all those things and making sure we've got the sort of, the, the necessary level of detail and information and using our trade networks of trade commissioners around the, the region and DFAT and Austrade who have been absolutely wonderful in, in joining with us in this because they love the fact that we've, and like the other states, we've got this sort of intent and architecture there that they can actually lean on as well. So we're in a good shape. It has to get some momentum. Um, and then again, I come back to this point that if we sit idle, then the, you know, other, other jurisdictions are already deploying additional trade, man, um, uh, trade uh, commissioners into, into regions that are employing business development managers into these regions for specific tasks. Uh, we in West Australia can't let that go without us, you know, attending to it. We don't want the, the starters gun to go post COVID, whenever that is, and we're still sitting back. Spot on. Emma, obviously you and your colleagues at the Fin Review have, have covered this topic pretty broadly uh, in terms of supply chains in particular. But if there's, is there insights that you might share in terms of how we should understand that in terms of its implications for WA? We are seeing is some um, interesting rethinking, and I'm just sort of alerted to this earlier on um, in terms of diversification of supply out of China, um, particularly in manufacturing and electronics. So we're seeing some countries shift some manufacturing. Manufacturing wages in China are now more than three times those in Vietnam, for example. So we're seeing some um, of these large multinationals look at what else can be done. And there are roles for Australian companies in there in terms of component supply. Um, so you've got to sort of keep your eye on that game. And also as far as RCEP goes, um, I think, you know, as the Trade Minister told us yesterday, it really promotes a lot of opportunities for diversification. You know, I've seen a lot of analysis of this new agreement, which is, you know, quite considerable. I think one of the best things about it is that it really shows ASEAN as, and Asia as, you know, a, a trade block that's right up there, you know, 30% of GDP covered by the RCEP. So that's an enormous amount of um, people and economic activity. And if you look at you know, the, the woes some of our exporters have had with China this year, diversification is clearly, you know, the more we can do the better. And this will make it easier in some, for some exporters to sell the product to other markets now aligned with RCEP. So Alicia, my guess is that in your role at, at Bauer Group Asia, uh, a lot of the people who are coming to you are coming to you because of their desire to ver diversify, diversify, diversify. Uh, your, your thoughts on this topic? Um, yeah, I think uh, diversification, as I mentioned, um, is definitely key. But I also see actually a lot of companies um, who have already exhibited a lot of interest in Indonesia or other countries around the region even before um, COVID, even before the US-China trade war, for example. So like Emma mentioned, right, it does, I think Southeast Asia and Asia in general already has a, 
a very high level of attractiveness um, for its consumer base, for its uh, demographic, for its purchasing power. So aside from being a destination for diversification, I think a lot of companies also want to make Asia its own hub, for example, uh, moving a lot of its um, operations uh, from regions like Latin America to Asia, uh, realizing that it's going to be the next um, drivers of growth for their business, essentially. I think many of you who follow the Perth East Asia Center will know, but our director of research, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, is primarily a trade and investment specialist and has written probably more than anybody, not just in Australia, but on the globe, about RCEP. And this has been for the last several years. And so I think he's been on the air for the last 48 hours straight, uh, <laughs> focusing on RCEP and its implications for, for Australia. Much of the broader global media narrative has focused on the fact that this is an agreement which cuts out the United States and cuts out India. Uh, and they tend to frame it as a China-led agreement. Uh, Jeff's basic position on this, and, and you can look at our website or just turn on the TV to find out uh, him say, find him saying it directly, is that this really has much more to do with ASEAN and ASEAN's leadership in this region. Uh, and it really has much more to do with tying China as part of this agreement, along with Korea and Japan and ASEAN, into a system of rules uh, that go yeah. back to basically giving us much more supp supp uh, secure supply chains. And so if you're viewing that in that context, from a very Australian pers uh, perspective, it's very helpful. Let, let me just add one comment on this and then I'll go around for a final round of, of questions. Um, there has been intense interest on the implications of probably the only story to break through the COVID bubble and to, to intertwine with the COVID bubble, which is the US elections. Uh, I'm someone who believes that much of the Australian na narrative around um, the US election has kind of missed the point. It's focused on the bilateral relationship when the bilateral relationship isn't the issue, it's not the problem. Uh, the, the real strength uh, of, of what's happened in the US is, is in the broader climate. So Australia has probably done better than any US ally in the world compared to let's say NATO or, or Canada or even Japan and Korea at managing the tumult of the last four years. Uh, so the bilateral relationship is strong. It's been handled well by two successful governments in Canberra as well as the opposition. But what they haven't been able to handle is a lot of what we've been talking about today, which is, you know, a, a region that's looking for, you know, a, a growingly more um, intertwined uh, and integrated system of standards, norms, rules, and laws. Uh, the, Australia as a country is probably the most vocal proponent of multilateralism in all its forms. Emma kind of mentioned this at the outset. Australia never met a free trade agreement it didn't like, right? Uh, and so one of the, the probably most underreported developments of the last uh, three years was this miraculous effort on the part of Australia and Japan to resurrect mm -hmm. the Trans-Pacific Partnership and just hold the door open for mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. And so the real potential of a Biden victory is that now the full spectrum of potential cooperation between Australia and the US in ASEAN with Indonesia, addressing the very real issues that Alicia laid out, you know, in regionalism is, is, is possible again. We, we've gone from, you know, trying to mitigate the damage and playing defense to at least having the potential to play offense again. And whether you're looking at it from a WA state perspective or from an Indonesian perspective or from a regional perspective, I think that's probably universally a good thing. Look, uh, we've, we've come to the end of our time, but I wanna go back to each of our panelists, starting with Alicia, uh, and then going to, to, to Emma, and then finally with the minister, just to, to get your, your final thoughts. Um, not only do we have viewers online who are watching us today, uh, but we're gonna have a chance to have this released. It's gonna be recorded, it's on our WA Austin website. So we hope people will refer back to this. What is it that you think people who know COVID, they know the difficulties that Alicia's laid out so well, in the, what should they be paying attention to today? And kind of, kind of use the ministers, what should they be doing today to prepare for post-COVID engagement uh, with ASEAN? Alicia, we'll start with you. That's a very loaded question, isn't it, Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what should they be prepared? Well, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, businesses that will thrive are actually, at least for, for Indonesia, I think our businesses that are already in market 
in Indonesia. But nonetheless, I think companies do need to remain engaged. And what I mean by that is that um, they have to recognize that Indonesia is attempting very hard, right, to taking the steps into the right direction. Yes, I mentioned that there are, there are a lot of shortcomings in their execution, um, but to be able to recognize the goodwill um, that the government is trying to present um, and capturing those opportunities by actually putting forth uh, real, for Western Australian businesses, I think um, a proposition of real value added to the country um, is what uh, government would, would um, I think, uh, would admire the most. Um, but uh, my, my advice would be just to remain engaged, I think, uh, despite, you know, a, a period of long uncertainty. You know, that's actually probably advice that, that would remain true even pre-COVID, right? Uh, one of the challenges oh, for is sure. remain <laughs> engaged despite periods of long uncertainty. Thank you, Alicia. I appreciate that. Emma, to you. Sure. Um, well, we've spoken a bit about ASAP, but I think one of the most interesting things you know, it's always quite hard to write an interesting story about trade agreements because there's so much analysis, you know, is it positive, is it negative, it all depends on who you look at and what your point of view is. Um, you know, the consensus seems to be that some Asian nations will lose out as um, other countries go to more efficient producers for their exports, but yet Asian leaders really push um, for this agreement to be signed. My understanding is that actually began life um, at a kitchen table, a uh, breakfast meeting at the then um, Indonesian trade minister, Marie Pangestu, who was always a great friend of Australia, our World Bank Managing Director. And that was sort of in late 2011. So it's been a long while. And I think, you know, it's, it's really a moment to savour for ASEAN. And we've traditionally been a bit, you know, what, what is the value of ASEAN? You know, this consensus agreement seems to be that they never actually decide anything because everyone has to agree. But they, now I think we're beginning to see, and it's taken quite a lot of um, a lot of inward searching, particularly with you know the geographical uh, sort of geopolitical uh, so U.S. versus China in recent years, and we've always sort of looked to the U.S. for how we manage Asia and how we approach Asia from Australia. And I think the last few years have shown us that, you know, that boat has well and truly sailed, okay? Uh, I think, you know, most of us would agree that a Biden presidency is a great thing, but I think he's got a lot on his plate at home for mm, quite a few yeah. years, right? I don't think, you know, we can look to him to come and, you know, re-establish multilateralism and, and, you know, get the Chinese to play fair in South China Sea. We have to work with our Asian neighbours in Asia, and there is tremendous opportunity there. And I think, you know, if you do take a few steps back, we will look upon this time as, as a real turning point in Australia's attitudes towards our region. Mm. Minister Tenley, final thoughts. Yeah, I'll pick up where Emma left off. And, and I think we will look back at 2020 as not just being a, a, a year of, of, you know, desperation, I suppose, um, but it's a, a year that can change us. And, and I'm talking about us in the regional sense. Um, and Emma's point is really true. Uh, we, I think we'll look back at this at this particular time as being that inflection point when Asia steps up, as the ASEAN steps up, and as a collective understands that the, the role of the middle power is essential in, in bulwarking a future that we can all believe in. Um, and so uh, the, the, the great power of the US, yes, it'll always be present, and yes, great power competition will China or will, will for our lifetime be a key feature. But really, you know, the 14 countries around China, for example, and us in, in, in the Asian region or the ASEAN region particularly, uh, actually have going to have the opportunity to actually uh, accelerate or take it to a level that we've not previously seen. That's why I talk about that inter intergenerational energy that will come through and actually live that dream. Um, there's a sporting analogy here, and, that's, uh, and this would be my advice, and is my advice to the enterprises here in Western Australia. You've got to play what's in front of you. And what we know is when, by having that sort of agility sort of attitude, agile sort of attitude, um, you, you accept that change will be your constant future, 
a, a feature of your future. So play what's in front of you, what they call eyes up football. Um, and, and then uh, I think you're going to be in a much better place to actually deliver the agility at your enterprise level, but understand that change is an opportunity. Well, that is a wonderful segue. Uh, if you're interested in playing what's in front of you, allow me to, to give you some highlights as to what's in front of us. Uh, as I indicated at the outset, this is the first in what it's going to be five straight days, every day at the same time, uh, between 2 and 3 p.m. or a little after 3 p.m. Uh, here in West Australian time. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the West Australia, ASEAN, uh, Southeast Asia relationship. Uh, tomorrow at this time, we're going to be focusing on agribusiness. It's going to be a program called Australia's Abundance and ASEAN's Demands. On Wednesday, it'll be 21st century energy and resource needs. On Thursday, unlocking investment opportunities. And then finally on Friday, engaging and reconnecting with ASEAN post-COVID. So we've got some other wonderful speakers to go. We couldn't have asked for a better start to this. And so on behalf of the Perth US Asia Center, on behalf of the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science, Innovation, and of course, of, uh, on behalf of Minister Peter Tinley, please uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, Alicia for her remarks, Emma for her remarks. And what we've done to play you out is, is now getting a little bit late in the afternoon. We have worked together with the, with the state government and others here to produce some kind of profile videos the first one is perfect for those of you who want an early afternoon uh, glass of wine. It is a profile of the, the Vas Felix Winery, uh, and we'll be doing this during the course of the week, other programs. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Emma. Please join us for a, a virtual glass of wine. Vas Felix was founded in 1967 by a cardiologist from Perth, Dr. Tom Cullity. He wanted to make the best possible wine that he could make. In 1972, the first Vas Felix wine was actually made, which today is regarded as the first wine made in the Mother River region. We are the founding wine estate of one of the youngest wine regions in Australia. We're also one of the absolute premium. The region is actually here for the long term and it's already proven its worth in the wine world. We contribute as a region around 20% of Australia's premium wine production. Vast Felix today is considered to be one of the larger wineries in Margaret River, probably employing around 40 to 45 full-time staff. We have over the years received a number of awards for our wines, but also recently we were actually named the New World Winery of the Year. Vast Felix has been exporting wines to ASEAN for around 20 years. We've really been trying to export the right wines to the right markets. There's been a lot of time spent building relationships with importers, with distributors in these different countries. Even in this very, very strange year that we're experiencing, we're actually seeing still some of those relationships really bear fruit. So Singapore is, a, is an incredibly important market. If you can sell uh, your wines in Singapore, you're actually selling in what I consider to be one of the toughest wine markets on the planet. Such a freight hub, such an international port. It's been a market where we've seen some real success. As many of the Asian markets are, I think they're really so well fitted to Margaret River because people are looking for quality and that's exactly what Margaret River can actually provide. But we're also now seeing a little bit more interest and uptake from Indonesia with some great relationships having been formed there and Vietnam as well. As an emerging market, it's very important. To some degrees, it's an established market as well. I think the, the ASEAN market offers a number of opportunities. There's a real growth that is generally occurring in these markets. There's a little bit of diversity that you can bring into the, into the business as well. To be reliant on one market, of course, is not a great idea. By diversifying into different markets, we can perhaps also help to diminish any fluctuations, economic or otherwise. The key this year to actually uh, maintaining relationships and trying to build on any success that we've had in some of these markets, I think it's simply come down to communication. Although we haven't been able to actually physically be in the market this year, things like Skype meetings and using Zoom and other platforms. The, the, the importance of the digital media has been undeniable. The way that we have developed our relationships has really been from the ground up and I think that has helped to build a closer relationship. The ASEAN market is really important to Vas Felix and, and our future goals. 
the vision there is to establish Vas Felix as one of the wine estates of the world. We think we have all of the ingredients to really position and prove that Vas Felix is actually one of the wine estates of the world, considered in the upper echelons with estates from, of course, from France, from California. To that end, we feel like the ASEAN markets are so important. The diversification that also comes from having these different markets is just so important because there's no guarantees in the future. Businesses like Bass Felix have a number of things that they can offer the ASEAN market. Quality is incredibly high, really is a food bowl, this entire southwest of Western Australia, but of course other parts of the state. I can show people the actual vines that have produced the fruit that have gone into these wines that are on this table next to me. Marta River, Bass Felix, Western Australia, we can do that to a T. So the products are incredibly consistent and that's obviously incredibly important for the end consumer, but it's also important for different players throughout the supply chain as well. I think West Australian businesses could better access opportunities presented by ASEAN with continued government assistance, whether that's federal government to, to export government assistance, government assistance to regions or government assistance to businesses to help them understand and evaluate markets and trends, how to navigate in those markets as well in this uh, very strange year that we find ourselves in. I think that's never been more important.